but I believe it is factually true that um, the Scientologists tried something like this with Sea Org. Could you? I assume you've looked into that. I'm, yes. I'm just curious what your what your understanding. Yeah, the, of that the bad is. guys are already doing this. Shouldn't the good guys do it too? <laughs> Thank you, Patri. Well, one of the things that I find interesting about Patri's work is that um, it really highlights how dependent uh, humans are on objects uh, and, uh, and how those objects define what we can do. And our next speakers, um, uh, Brian Bishop and, B and Ben Lipkowitz, uh, are working on uh, a new framework for um, designing and building objects. Thanks, Todd. All right, so that was a great talk. I really like that. I like to see Study Institute. That's great work. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how to make a civilization seed and downloading hardware over the web. And when, when I say downloading hardware over the web, I'm talking about uh, literally I want a car, make it show up in front of me and uh, make that happen. Here we go. Thanks. All right. So the idea is that uh, if you have all these modular units, like on the seasteading instance, uh, eventually we want to have a civilization seed to take it to another planet maybe. Um, so you see here going from Earth to uh, another planet. And if we can do it once, then we can do it multiple times, and we can do it as much as we want. Um, and this allows for as much development and diversity as you want. So society is going from analog to more digital, and if you're here and you don't believe that, I, I don't know why you're here then. Um, so you could say that there's kind of a DNA of civilization that's emerging. Um, you could say that objects make up uh, the artifacts and culture and so on. So uh, Neil Gershenfeld once said that uh, it's here we won, we already won the digital revolution, so we don't have to have it again, and we don't have to keep on having it. But uh, you see, his background is that he's made these things called fab labs out of MIT, it's a media lab, and they all use proprietary technology to build uh, as much manufacturing equipment as possible in a small space. And I believe Todd set one up in Afghanistan, which was awesome. Um, so. You really can't do that because of patents, copyright, and data jails. You just do that um, unless you have a lot of money. So you have to reinvent wheels and lots of wheels. And if you're reinventing everyone's wheels, you can't get much stuff done. And you can also be shot. So there has to be an alternative to this. Um, and there is. They've been working on that in the software world. Uh, it's called Debian. Um, there's a huge history of uh, free software, starting with Richard Stallman in the 1980s. And it went on with Linux and other events. And what the Debian people did is they started to shift the burden of software away from users having to install software and made their computers install software for them to figure out all the details and technicalities. And the way they did that is by making something called a package. And the package is what is the unit of Debian so that you can install software and it takes care of all the peculiarities for you. It's all free software, all open source, and you can go home and download it if you want. So about Debian, um, there are certain cost models, methods of estimating how much software is worth or how much value was put into it. And in the case of Debian, it was about $13 billion. And that's not including all the resulting development work that has gone into it, such as people that use it on a daily basis. Um, so as I said, it's all completely free and open source software. Um, there's a social contract to maintain integrity of vision. And um, the burden was shifted from end users to maintainers, a core group of people who uh, are dedicated to this. And also, it's flown on the space shuttle a few times, which I think is awesome, the uh, ideals of America and freedom. So these are just some of the points that the Debian project makes up. They talk about how freedom and uh, distribution restrictions and so on don't apply to them, or freedom does, but distribution restrictions don't, and so on. So to a lot of people who uh, are into intellectual property, this makes no sense, because this is impossible in other parts of the world, but on the internet, this has been made possible. So there was a study in 2003 that looked over this project, and they showed, uh, look, how many packages we have. And it went all the way up to 10,000 in 2002. And uh, they just started off with just a few, with about 2,000. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that's wrong, uh, zero, because you have to start somewhere. And then you move up to about 10,000. Um, and again, this is the number of people involved in the project. And between like 1997 and 1998, um, the number of people doubled that were involved in this project. It started in 94. Um, and then in the paper that I got these diagrams from, they projected that there's going to be 100,000 packages of software, free software, that anyone can have by 2006. No, no. <laughs> that didn't happen. But the curves were a bit off. But 
I still think it was a good job. So this was a picture of what was on my computer. I run Debian, and this is a network graph of all the different software packages installed. And the big ones are uh, hard drive space. And then you can also see uh, to the left at the bottom of the red box, there's a lot of connectivity. That means that the software is highly interconnected to each other. And it's also becoming a lot easier because of Ubuntu. Um, Mark Shuttleworth has put in a lot of money with Canonical and his company. And you can literally go download a CD of Ubuntu and install it. And when you're done with it, you can turn off your computer again and you're back to normal. So you should try it out. So I think the real value of Debian is severely underestimated because there's $13 billion of work from free volunteers. <laughs> so in the world of objects, and when you're trying to do a civilization seed or you're trying to make things, uh, you have to do a lot of crap that doesn't really matter in the end. Uh, and there's no way to get around that right now. So what if we do this, where we shift all the burden to maintainers instead of individual makers? And this is uh, another XKCD cartoon. We already had one today, but, but I think this one's better because the idea is that I don't want to have to make my own sandwich. I want you to make it for me. Or not really you, but a computer or a machine. So the idea is downloading hardware from the web. Um, we shift the burden from, from uh, users to maintainers. We have policies, formats, package metadata, hardware dependencies. That means in order to make a car, you need a lathe. And to make a lathe, you need metal, and so on and so forth. And so this is all in a computer format. We're developing this software. It's called SKDB. You can download it for free. It's also open source hardware. Um, and it's all based on physical units that you can measure. And the main method of this is called app git. This is a more technicality. But the idea is that a user shouldn't have to think about how they make stuff. They should be thinking about what they're making. And we have a bit of an app store we've been developing. The website isn't released yet, but you can buy hardware by clicking Make, and then instructions are printed out for you on how to make the thing that you want, such as a wearable, or maybe uh, you want a laser cannon to take over the world, a robot army, perhaps. And uh, Ben has a few words on uh, the culture around this. So I'm going to talk about what's already existing uh, today. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. Debian, when they started, they had zero packages. But that didn't mean there wasn't any free software existing. There were tons of uh, programs al already. What Debian did was they put it in uh, a well-defined format so that it was easy to use. And similarly, today, there's a lot of open source hardware already out there, but we just have to package it up. Um, so starting off, this is a four by panel CNC router. It's uh, made entirely out of structural steel, and you can put one together for a couple thousand dollars, which is a lot better than paying $30,000 to buy one. Uh, this is a vertical machining center. You can make molds for injection molded plastic or space shuttle parts or anything. Um, the multi-machine is made out of junk engine parts, and so you don't actually have to have any precision machine tools to make this. You can bootstrap yourself up from junk. And it's not very important in America, but in a lot of countries, they don't have anything except for junk. Uh, but we can still do things you know, without investing a lot of uh, infrastructure and mass, like put together little toy robot arms and, and use them for useful things, like uh, pick and place electronics, for example. Uh, this is an automatic wire cutter by the same people, so they don't have to sit there manually stripping wires constantly. Uh, it makes a lot of wires an hour. Uh, the hexapod machine tool, this is kind of like a geodesic dome, except, you know, these uh, milling machines weigh a lot. This one's like a couple tons. And there's a reason for that. It's because they need it to get the rigidity in order to cut metal. It has to be a very strong structure. Now, the angular, angular uh, design of this means that you can have a very strong structure, but also weighs very little so that you can uh, transport it around without needing a bulldozer. Uh, all these weird robots are controlled by open source software today. Uh, the one that I like is called Enhanced Machine Controller. And you can control arms and milling machines and spaceships and anything you want. Uh, this is from the Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories. Basically, it's a big tub of sugar, and you melt it with a hot air rework tool. Uh, Fab at Homes from Cornell University. You can make, uh, you can print out functional batteries out of zinc paste, and also flexible 
silicone structures.